My name's Sasha Abramsky. I live in California. I'm a freelance journalist. As you can tell from the accent, I didn't grow up in California. I grew up in London, moved to America when I was in my early 20s. And for most of the last 20 years, I've been reporting on the underside, maybe, of the American dream. I've always been fascinated by this country because there's so much opportunity here. There's so much choice, there's so much freedom. But on the other hand, there's also so much that's complicated about the American dream. It's not this thing that's always perfect, and it's not this thing that doesn't have road bumps. And I've always been fascinated in those road bumps, and sort of what goes wrong on the edges, on the margins of the American story. And I think the reason I'm so fascinated is because this country is so large, and its impact, not just on Americans, but on the world community is so large. And one of the things that struck me is there's a mismatch sometimes between the dream and the reality, not for everybody, but for a large number of people. One of the things that I've been amazed by in my reporting over the years is the number of people who have been left behind by the broader American dreams progression. People who have had jobs and lost those jobs. People who've always worked minimum wage jobs. I remember meeting a woman while I was reporting the American way of poverty. Her name is Mary Vasquez. She's a 67 or 68 year old woman, a Walmart worker in a suburb of Dallas, Texas. She'd had cancer, she'd had heart problems, she'd had diabetes. She came into the interview hobbling on a walker. She looked far older than 67. And she was working full time and bringing in less than $20,000 a year, I believe. She had all kinds of heart problems, health problems. She was spending thousands of dollars a year on medicines. And she was having to pay somebody to take her to work because she was too sick to take the buses to work and she didn't know how to drive. And so she was having to pay a neighbor gas money to take her to this work where she would stand on her feet for eight hours a day. And I thought, you know, this is, this is such a heartbreaking story, but it's so common. Um, I met somebody in Albuquerque, an undocumented migrant, and she'd come across the border with her daughter after another of her kids had been killed. She's working four, five, six dollars an hour as a home help. And again, she had nothing. And I said to her, what do you own? And she looked at me, she said, I own the clothes on my back. And the clothes on her back were clothes that her employers had given her, basically charity hand-me-downs. I said, do you have a bank account? She didn't have any money. Do you have a car? No. What are you going to do when you get old? And she starts to cry. And she says, well, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I met somebody, an undocumented worker again, on the border in El Paso, Texas. For several years, he'd lived in a community center. He just slept on the floor there. And he had two plastic bags of clothes to his name. And a few weeks earlier, he'd pawned the only other thing he'd owned, which was a black and white portable television. But work was slow, and he'd had to get rid of the television just to buy food. And I went around the country as I did the American way of poverty. And one after another after another, I came upon these stories. There was a middle-aged man, a steel worker in Stockton. He was also a, an official in his church. He'd lost his job at the beginning of the economic recession and he was struggling to stay in his home. His home was massively underwater. It was worth far less than what he paid for it. He couldn't sell it, but he couldn't pay to keep it. And he talked to me about curling up in a fetus position on his bed and just sobbing, wondering how he was going to survive and how he was going to keep his family afloat. I went to Appalachian, Pennsylvania, a small town. I met an accountant, a woman in her late 50s. And again, she'd lost her job at the beginning of the recession. She'd been earning quite decent money, 50000 60000 a year. She spent a couple of years on unemployment, ran through the unemployment, was looking for jobs all over the country and couldn't find anything. And when I met her, she'd finally found work again. But the work was paying less than $20,000 a year. And this was a woman who was getting near to the age of retirement. She had two kids, one of whom was in college, one of whom was finishing high school. She had nothing left. She couldn't pay her housing bills. She couldn't pay her utilities bills. Her car was about to die. She couldn't afford to buy food. She talked about eating chicken bouillon. She said, you can do a lot with it. You can pretend it's chicken, except there's no chicken. And the more I heard these stories, the more I thought, this is a book. You have to tell the story of the American underside. Um, and that's basically what the American way of poverty is. 50 years after Michael Harrington wrote The Other America, my story, The American Way of Poverty, is the story of people a generation and a half later, two generations later, equally in hardship, equally in desperation,
and equally invisible in many ways. One of the things Michael Harrington wrote about was that the other America was in the crevices of affluence, that you had this millions of people at the bottom of the economy in the most affluent society in the, on earth. And those people were generally invisible. They lived in slums or they lived in um, ex-urban communities, rural communities. And to the ordinary newspaper reading American in New York in 1962 or 63, Harrington's other America might have been on the moon. And I think one of the things that struck me as I reported the, other, the American way of poverty in the year 2011, 2012, 2013 was the same phenomenon. That even after the economic collapse, this was a country with more billionaires than anywhere else on earth. And even after the economic collapse, this was a country with more fancy cars and more McMansions than anywhere else on earth. And yet if you looked carefully, if you went outside those media hubs, if you went to trailer parks, if you went to suburbs in places like Stockton, where the economy had just collapsed, if you went to colonias where hundreds of thousands of undocumented migrants live, if you went to these forgotten towns in Appalachia, or if you just went to a place, an inner city area like North Philadelphia, or the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, you saw a level of poverty that was just as pervasive and just as soul-destroying as what Michael Harrington was experiencing half a century earlier. And I think that's the main message of the American way of poverty is this exists. It's a reality. We have to look at it. We have to look at what it means to us as a country. We have to look at what it means to our politics. We have to look at what it means to our sense of community. And once we've done that, once we've looked at what it means, then we look ahead. What can we do to change this? What can we do to create a set of policies that will actually bring people out of poverty? that will provide a decent way of life for the millions of children who go to bed hungry at the moment or who go to school in communities where there's not enough money to provide textbooks, where gangs are omnipresent, where the parents don't have work, where the parents don't have stable housing. Because I think we have an obligation as a society, as a community, to live up to our ideals. The American dream is founded on ideals. It's one of the most wonderful set of ideals, one of the most wonderful set of human aspirations that any community in any moment in history has encountered or has generated. And we can live up to it. 50 years ago, when Lyndon Johnson started the war on poverty, he basically looked America in the eye and he said, look, we can't afford to ignore this anymore. Yes, it's expensive to fix, but if we don't fix it, will corrode our own society, our own set of ideals. I think it's the same today. If we ignore the fact that tens of millions of Americans don't have jobs that pay decent wages, if we ignore the fact that tens of millions of Americans don't have housing that is stable, or that tens of millions of Americans don't have health care they can afford, if we ignore these things, we cheapen ourselves as a society. And in the long run, that's far more expensive than the sorts of policies that I propose in the American way of poverty. And I think that for all of these reasons, the stories of people like Matthew Joseph, the steel worker in Stockton, or Mary Vasquez, the Walmart worker in Dallas, or all of the other people that I talk to, the hundreds of people I talk to across thousands of miles in this book, if we ignore their plight, we cheapen the American story. And that's something that we just can't afford to do. I've always been completely addicted to the American road. Um, when I was about 20, I was a student in England. I came with a couple of friends to America and we got a car and we spent 10 weeks basically zigzagging around the country in this beat up old Ford LTD. And ever since then, I've thought that the best way to see a country this large and this diverse and with this many different cultures and communities and subcultures and so on is to get on the road. Um, and all of my reporting over the years has been immersion based. I've gone to places, out of the way places, and I've driven around, I've talked to people, I've found communities, I've spent time in them. And the American way of pro poverty is no different. I um, basically did a series of enormous road trips, a couple cross country trips, um, did a circle around the southwest and south for a few weeks. I flew out to Hawaii, did a bunch of interviews on the big island there. I went up to the northwest and did a lot of driving around there. And basically what I find is that 
you have to cultivate sources. It doesn't matter if you're in a big city, small village, doesn't matter if you've um, been in that area before. You're asking people really intimate questions about their lives. You're asking people about their dreams and about their fears and about their hopes for the future. You're asking people about some of the most difficult chapters in all their years of, of, of life. You're talking to them and asking them to tell you, well, what does it feel like to lose a job? What does it feel like to go to bed hungry? What does it feel like to know that you're very sick, but know that if you go to the doctor, it's going to mean you can't afford to feed your children for a couple of weeks? What does it mean to wake up one morning, see that gas prices have gone up 10, 15 cents a gallon, and realize that next time you fill your car to go to work, that's going to involve a set of compromises. What bills don't I pay? What meals can I skip? And so you can't really do this cold. If you go to people cold and you ask those kinds of questions, they clamp down. They don't want to talk to you. So I spent a huge amount of time basically building up trust, going to um, organizations that work with people in difficulties, going to food banks, going to churches, going to welfare agencies, and talking to people, explaining to them the project, explaining to them the importance of bringing alive these stories. And then I would go and I would meet people, I would talk to them for hours, sometimes with a tape recorder rolling. Um, I did a lot of work for my website, thevoicesofpoverty.org, and sometimes with no tape recorder. And I take notes, I talk to them about their experiences. Sometimes I go back two, three, four times and I build up their stories. And then at the end I'd say, do you know anyone else I should talk to? And sometimes they'd say no, oftentimes they'd say yes. And through word of mouth, through just spending a lot of time in these communities, many, many months over several years working on these kinds of issues, I ended up with this huge source list of people who trusted me, wanted to tell their stories, thought that it was important that their stories actually were heard, thought that it was important that people realized the kinds of experiences they were living through. And the more I did this, the more I realized the complexity, that this isn't a story you can cover in a few weeks or a few months. This is a story as complicated as modern day America. If you're talking about poverty, you're talking about old people, young people, black, brown, white, you're talking about rural, you're talking about urban. Sometimes you're talking about people with college degrees. Sometimes you're talking about people who dropped out of school before they finished high school. You're talking about the full panoply of what America is today. And I think you only realize that, or I only realized this, after I spent many, many months on the road doing these interviews. And after a while, I realized every stereotype, every preconception, everything I thought I knew about poverty coming into the project was far too simple that this was something that was such a complicated story and it had so many entrance points and it had so many ways of expressing itself, so many ways of intersecting with the broader American story that the only way I was going to tell it was just absolute immersion. And I really did. I just went all over the country. Every time I had a few days when I didn't have other commitments, I'd get on the road, I'd do the interviews. Um, and that's how I wrote The American Way of Poverty. And so the second part of the American way of poverty is essentially a blueprint to what a new war on poverty would look like if we could generate the political will, if we could generate the cultural and communal will to really put our efforts as a country into this. Turns out, actually, it's not that expensive. That if you shift around maybe 2-3% of this country's vast resources... If you change priorities just a little bit in who we tax, how we tax them. If you put a concentrated effort into improving schools, into setting up job training programs, into in some cases setting up public works programs, that there's a template already there that we can use and that we can expand on that would have a huge impact on the lives of tens of millions of Americans. In the second half of the American Way of Poverty, I show how we do this. I put out there a series of policy solutions and suggestions that would have a tremendous impact on who we are as a country and on what kind of public policies that we embrace. I hope collectively the stories of America's poor, combined with the solutions, the ways out of the morass that we're currently in, that cumulatively 
this is a story worth telling and a story worth reading.